And I'm Doug, if, you, if I haven't met you. And I know there's some of you I haven't met. I'm the pastor here. In fact, I've been the pastor here for a long time now. Uh, it'll be 27 years in August. That's hard to believe. So when I, when I uh, came, just being here is kind of neat for me because this is where we had worship when I came. This was the worship center when I came and was for a long time until we built the, what we call the new worship center. It's not that new now, but it's, you know, we built it. And I'm so glad you're here. Some of you I haven't met yet or, or, or barely met, and maybe I'll get to meet you later. You're always welcome to FBCO. I'll give you a free sermon any Sunday. Um, and I, did, I heard him say something about life groups. I just want to say one quick word about life group. So we have worship services at 940-11, blended service and a modern service. You're welcome to come, of course, to the worship services. And then there's life groups that meet, most of them on Sunday morning, a few on another night of the week or something. And those are Bible studies, smaller group Bible studies. And then we have D groups, which are a little more exclusive. That's for guys who are uh, accountability groups. That's for people who are really serious about having their devotional time and things because it's a little more accountability. But anyway, those are all things that help you grow, and I just wanted to mention it. So if you have your Bibles or if you have your, the notes, I've got it on the notes. I'm going to look at First Chronicles chapter 11. And so I read the Bible. You don't get paid to read the Bible. I mean, that's kind of what I, I so I, it's not unusual that I get to read the Bible, but I read the Bible through. I started reading the Bible through at least once a year when I was um, young. Uh, and I mean young, you know, like you're young. <laughs> so, and I'd probably, I, I guess I read the Bible through the first time probably when, in my early 20s. And then when I was in my uh, mid-20s, I just said, I'm going to read it at least once every year. I mean, like I say, I'm, I mean, I can consider that part of my job even. So it's not like I'm having an advantage. I get that. So, I, so at least every year and, and a little more frequently than that now, but at least every year I come across this story that I'm going to read to you. And it's, it just started jumping out at me every time. I mean, I read it just, uh, I don't know, maybe just days ago in my devotional time, I, I came to the story again. And it just jumps out at me every time. It's just been a story that's been meaningful for me, and I hope it will be for you. And so I'm going to talk to you about uh, in a pit on a snowy day, all right? In a pit on a snowy day. So I'm going to read from First Chronicles chapter 11, and then I'm going to read beginning with verse 22. Are you ready? We're going to talk about this guy named Benaiah. So Benaiah, the Bible says, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was the son of a brave man from Kabziel, a man of many exploits. And Benaiah killed two sons of Ariel of Moab, and he went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. He also killed an Egyptian who was seven and a half feet tall. Even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand like a weaver's beam, Benaiah went down to him with a club, snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and then killed him with his own spear. May I just say parenthetically, that is cold-blooded. I mean, that's just like one of the most amazing stories to me. Verse 24. These were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, who had a reputation among the three warriors. He was the most honored of the 30, but he didn't become one of the three. David put him in charge of his bodyguard. We see a few other places with this man, Benaiah, but let me just tell you a little of what we know about him, then we're going to look at this story. So Benaiah, which means uh, God builds, is just uh, his father, we know, is a, was a priest, so he's in the tribe of Levi. And he was a super brave guy, as you probably got that impression just reading the little bit of the story here. I mean, just he did some amazing things. And so he became a part of what we sometimes call the mighty men of David. David was the early king in Israel. And he becomes one of the one of the mighty men, this group of 30. And he's so effective, fights so well, so brave, so loyal to David. He stayed loyal to David even when a couple of sons tried to usurp David's place. I mean, he stayed loyal. That he eventually became David's bodyguard. And then after David died and Solomon becomes the, his, the king, Benaiah is the commander of the army. So he has a prominent role to play in Israel. Like he's not super famous from Bible terms, if you've not heard of him before, I mean, you know, it's not unusual. Benaiah is not a, there's just a really some small sections about him in the Bible. But he was a super prominent guy. He was faithful, loyal, dependable, brave, and he teaches us some things. So here's, I want to get, I want to have a basic principle I want you to get. I think maybe, is it notes that you take? I mean, do you have some like blanks in there? All right, here's the first one. Ready? 
Ready to write this down? Doers do what need to be done. That's the basic premise I want you to get tonight. Doers do what need to be done. I'm going to want you to be a doer. You're going to maybe guess this, to be a doer, not just a talker. I am a, I'm a talker by, like, <laughs> a little bit by inclination and by job. So I talk, you know, Sunday morning, blah, 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 for hours and hours, you know. It's, it, it's not that long a sermon. It feels like it sometimes, but it's not that long. But I talk. And lots of people are talkers. I mean, I meet a lot of talkers in life, but I'm talking about being a doer. Or not just a dreamer. And I love dreamers. I mean, I love for you to have big dreams. But there are a lot of people who have dreams and they never take any action. I mean, that's a really common story. Some of you may have dreams and sometimes they're just like, you, you've never taken a step in that direction perhaps even, but it's just a dream. Fine to have dreams, but dreams don't, I mean, that's, that's not like, nothing has happened yet because of the dream, but action, that matters. And the Bible talks a great deal about action, uh, more than just words and more than just dreams, but to do something. So here's how the Bible says it in James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And the Bible says many people are hearers. They hear the word. Like you, you, I don't know, go to a worship service and hear some guy talk or to a YA night and hear OB drone on and on and on and on and on and on and on. <laughs> well, great. You're hearing the word. But the Bible says be doers of the word and not hearers only. It's a warning to us. Deceiving yourselves, that passage says. Deceiving yourselves. So the danger is that you would just know the story of Beniah or know the story of, you know, know who David is or Moses or some stories in the New Testament, and, but not put into practice things, the things you know. So I want to talk to you about being a doer. Uh, the Nike is like newer than, it's younger than me. You know, Nike started like after, that's how, I mean, I know it seems old to you, but I told someone when they came in, I told them that I wasn't in this age group and they were really surprised. They were so surprised by that. But Nike is, like, when they came along, they finally got this um, slogan. Do you know the slogan? You know the slogan, right? Just do it. Everyone knows. I mean, everyone knows it. They started, I think they originally were going to say, don't do it. And then they changed it last minute to just, to, to just do it. And that was a smart. No, they didn't really. They didn't really do it. <laughs> so, you're a little too naive about some things, guys. I'm just sorry. <laughs> just do it. And they're saying, you know, don't just talk about it. Don't just dream it. But put it into practice. So let's, with that kind of in mind, let's talk about this guy, Benaiah, and some lessons he teaches us, and I'll tell you a couple stories along the way, all right? So I have three principles, and you can write these three things down as we really deal with the premise of doers do what need to be done. They don't just talk about it, they don't just dream about it, but they do what needs to be done. Let's, oh, hey, before I give you this, I'm gonna give you one little nugget here that someone needs, I bet someone needs this. So there's a trait, my kids have all heard me say this to them, but uh, there's a trait that successful people have in large measure, almost every really successful person has this trait that people who aren't very successful tend not to have. I just want you to know about it, all right? It's a simple thing. It's a to-do list, a to-do list. I bet some of you do this. A to-do list is a super, like, you just make a list, maybe, in the, you know, when I come into the office, I often do this. I'll just write down, I want, to get, I want to do these things, and I prioritize it. And then it is the most satisfying thing in the world to scratch that out because I accomplished it. That's one of the great geniuses of the to-do list. You just scratch it out, and it kind of reminds you, all right, this is the, I have to do this, I want to do this, and maybe I'll get to this. And, man, I put several things on that. I just wanted to remind you. It's, it's really the whole premise of I want you to become a doer, and so let's talk about three principles that'll help you to understand this. Number one, doers can learn from others. Doers can learn from others. So in verse 22, the Bible says, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was the son of a brave man from Kabziel, a man of many exploits. So that's talking about his dad, by the way, not him. But he's saying he's the son of a brave man from Kabziel. He's a brave man, this father, a brave man. We don't know what he did. We just know that he was brave. Uh, bravery in some ways is the opposite of, I mean, it's like, it's where we decide to do something even though we're fearful. It's not the absence of fear. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't be brave. I mean, like if you were just 
too ignorant to realize how dangerous something is. You know, that's not necessarily brave, but it's where you recognize, I'm not going to live in fear. And even though I am fearful of this, I'm going to do what needs to be done. And the Bible says he was from Kabziel, which is like this little, the remotest corner of Judah, no prominence in that place. And he was a man of many exploits. We're not even told what those are, just a man of many exploits. And it, so I want to say a word about the influence of parents. You may have had great parents or not so great parents. And, you know, it's, I mean, I guess that's the categories, good or not so good. You know, that's, their, that's your choices, I suppose. And if you had great parents, they had tremendous influence on you. And if you had not great parents, they had tremendous influence on you, right? Whether they were good or not. And if you'll just recognize that, like, I find myself, I found myself when my, when I had children, I found myself playing this little tape in the back of my head, this tape would play that said, what would dad do? You know, what would mom do? I didn't, I didn't like turn it on, it just was there. And I found myself thinking for good or for bad. Now my parents were good, I mean, I'm glad they had good parents, but even if they'd been bad parents, that tape would have still played because you, they influence you so much. And one of the reasons Beniah does these great things that he does is because he had a dad who was a brave man of many exploits in the middle of a little bitty town no one even knew about, but he just saw his dad do these hard things. I'm, what, I'm, what I want you to see is what you do is gonna have an influence on others. So if you become a doer, it's gonna influence others. And if you never do what God wants you to do, it'll have an influence on others as well. And so if you've got great parents, man, thank the Lord for it and learn from them. And if you've got parents that weren't so great, Thank the Lord for them and learn from them. I mean, you don't have to follow their example. Learn from their mistakes. But, and I want to encourage you too to, as I talk about influence, to get some friends. And maybe that's why you ought to get in a life group. And some of you who are super outgoing, you just, you just see the need for fellowship so much. But some of you are more introverted and it's harder for you to, it's harder for you to just, you, you want to stay in the background more. And so going to a life group seems intimidating, but I suggest to you that there will be some great benefit in you doing something that's hard and getting in a life group, even though you may be more introverted and studying the Bible, even though you may feel a little intimidated by that at first. All right. So this guy learns from his father and I'm, let me tell you a story now. I, I love history books and I just read all these crazy history books and for whatever reason, I've never been in the military, but I love like war history and stuff. So I'll tell you a war history story, okay? You ready for, I know some of you don't care deeply about history or war history especially, but there was this thing in the old days, there was this thing called World War II. And I'm not that old, but I mean, it was before my time, <laughs> but it was in World War, but World War II. And in World War II, if you know anything about it, they're bad guys. You know, Hitler, you've heard of Hitler, but bad guy, you know, bad guy. In case you didn't know, bad guy. And then there was the, you know, the allied forces who were fighting for freedom, et cetera. And so it came down to, I mean, lots and lots and lots of battles, but eventually there was a, a, a thing called D-Day where the uh, allied forces landed on the beaches of Normandy, France, where they would, so they could eventually invade Germany. I mean, it was just, a, it was a big deal. Saving Private Ryan was a movie about that. Others, oh my goodness. But even before, and there's, I mean, people bled and died on those beaches. I mean, really amazing things. People, our forefathers, good and bad, right? For people before us, good and bad, but they, were, they did some amazing things. And those guys, like young guys jump, jumping out of, out of uh, transports onto beaches, getting shot at, and, oh, and that's a different level of bravery than I know anything about. So before D-Day, I mean, that morning, Guys that were paratroopers got dropped behind the enemy lines so they could, you know, do damage behind the enemy lines so the guys' troops could get on the shore to get a kind of a foothold and get onto land. And so the, if you've ever, maybe some of you have heard of a Band of Brothers, it was a, like an HBO movie, uh, television series. I've never seen that full HBO thing, but I read the books. I mean, I, I like the books better than the shows usually anyway. And I read Band of Brothers by a guy named Stephen Ambrose. And it told the story of this guy named Dick Winters, who I thought is just, as I read about him, I thought, man, what a great leader. Hardly anybody would know him. He didn't rise any great prominence. Uh, and he really is only famous because he happened to be a part of this company that was so decorated that did so many great things. 101st Airborne, Easy Company, 
And they just did some amazing things. They, so they get parachuted in behind enemy lines, and then the American soldiers are landing at D-Day, and they are fighting you know, German soldiers behind the lines going, it was, it was amazing. They did some amazing things. So he was super decorated. He went all the way into Germany. I mean, the whole company was an amazing company. And so years later, when he was a grandfather, his grandson, maybe his granddaughter, said to him, uh, Grandpa, were you a hero in the war? And here's what Dick Winter said. He said, no, but I was in a company of heroes, he said. I was in a company of heroes. He was talking about his easy company that many of them um, bled and died and, and the great bravery. And Grandpa, were you a hero in the war? No, but I was in a company of heroes. Here's what I want to ask of you. I want to ask you to get in the company of heroes. I want you to hang around some people who love the Lord. I want you to find some people in your life who are willing to stand against the culture when it's wrong or to stand for what's right when it's unpopular or to, or, or to climb the narrow way, even though it feels like so many others are just going down the wide path that leads to destruction to use biblical language. I wanna ask you to get in the company of people who love God's word and who care about things that matter and who are living for something more than just the moment and more than just pleasure or power or things. I wanna ask you to get in the company of heroes mm -hmm. and doers can learn from others. There's a second principle to note. Would you write this down? Doers tackle hard things. Doers tackle hard things. I mean, that's, that's what they do. That's really the story of Benaiah. Christianity is not about ease and comfort. Christianity does hard things. Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, he said, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That's what Jesus said. Yes. And does that sound like a super easy? Like, it, was your idea of Christianity, it's going to make you just like really, it's, it's going to make you comfortable, and it's going to, the whole goal of Christianity is just to make you feel really good and special and warm inside and just like grandma, you know, she just made you feel so special and gave you that warm blanket and, you know, I don't know, whatever, like little, did you have like a little stuffed toy that she would get, a little Mr. Num Nums or something that she'd have you play with? And is that what Christians just like make you feel comfortable? Sometimes the Christian faith is about uh, deny yourself, take up your cross today and follow Jesus. And Jesus did some hard things. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. Hard things. And so that's, that's part of what it will mean to follow the Lord, your willingness to do some hard things that many people are not willing to do. So let's note some things um, young Benaiah did here. Uh, he killed a couple Moabites. That's what the Bible tells us. Killed a couple Moabites. Moab was a country that's on the south side of Israel. Um, Ruth was from Moab, who married Boaz, who became a grand, uh, grandparents of young King David eventually in the lineage of Jesus. But Moab often was just fighting against Israel. They just always had fights. They, they tended to follow uh, idols and fight the Israelites. And man, it's, we don't know the details behind it except that he killed two Moabites. All right, pretty big deal. That's a hard thing. The Bible says he killed a lion. Verse 22 says he killed a lion. I'm a big animal show guy. I love animal shows. How many of you here like love animal shows? You love animal shows? Anybody? Don't, you don't even want to raise your hand, do you? I'm sorry. Thank you. How many of you hate animal shows? You hate animal shows. You didn't raise your hand. Okay, because you, you feel guilty about it now. Because I like them. And you say, oh, I'll hurt his feelings. It's all right. You don't have to like them. Vicky just tolerates them. She'll watch them because she doesn't like them. I love animal shows. And I love, like, there's nothing more relaxing to me than, a, like, nature shows. Like, a lion tearing into a zebra or something is, like, the most <laughs> relaxing. It just is. I don't know. Just watch those things. Are, and they are... Lions are amazing. So we go to mission trips. Our church goes to mission trips. We've been connected to uh, Uganda for years. We've gone to mission trips to Uganda for years and other places in Africa. I've gone on a few places where I've seen some lions. It's just, I mean, they were incredible. They're incredible beasts. And they, they don't, I mean, they can tear apart these huge animals, much bigger than them. I just, he killed one. I don't know all the details of why or what, but 
There was some problem there and he took care of it. Or he killed an Egyptian, this giant, in verse 23, seven and a half feet tall, he killed the guy with his own spear. And he did hard things. The reason we know about Benaiah is because he was willing to do hard things that needed to be done. When I was a, um, a freshman in high school, I, des I decided to go out for football at my little school. I was in a little school here in Illinois, small town Illinois, just you know, 60 kids in my class. And so sports was my way. I wanted to get, you know, be on the in crowd, I guess. And plus my family was really big on sports. I have three brothers. They were all sports. My dad loves sports. So, okay, I'm going to go play football. And it was, it was terrible. I mean, I hated every second of it. I got... It was hard, I got knocked down. There were bigger guys who would just knock me down. Guys who had experience, even littler guys who were, I mean, knew what they were doing. I just, I, you know, I'd stand up too straight, some guy would knock you down. Even just practices were hard. And I came back, in those days, they, like the goal, all the coaches in my early years were World War II vets, you know, had gone to D-Day. The guys who survived D-Day, they didn't. And so they treated football like it was war, you know, and all the brutality and stuff. We'd have two a days, they called two practices every a day, and one in the morning, one in the evening. It'd just be so sore, muscles I'd never used before. And I just wanted to quit. Everything about it made me want to quit. And uh, I, I didn't quit. My parents didn't like me quitting things. and. I didn't really want to be a quitter. I didn't really want to play anymore, but I didn't want to quit. So I just stayed with it. And, and then the next year got better. You know, as I got a little, I kind of knew what to do a little bit more and I got a little faster. And then, you know, I started playing more. I played football all the way through college, as hard as that is to believe. And football became very, really a meaningful thing for me. In college, it led me to a Christian college and it helped me to get deeply connected. And, and God used it in my life to teach me some lessons. The only reason I learned those lessons were, was because I stayed with something hard. But almost everything I've done in life has been sort of hard. I mean, every good thing has been sort of hard. Sort of hard. I mean, like, when you see somebody on TV, some football player score a touchdown, you say, oh, my, look, it made it, it make it look easy. They got knocked down 100, 1,000, 10,000 times before that. And we just don't see it. We don't see all the sweat, all the pain. We just see the victory and we say, oh, look how great that is. Well, they did hard things. And I decided maybe I should apply the same discipline that I'm learning in sports. Maybe I should apply this to my spiritual life because like, I'm not very consistent in my quiet time, my devotional time. I, I go to football practice every day. You know, I do that really consistently. Maybe I could get more consistent on my devotional time. You know? maybe, I could, maybe I could have some discipline when it comes to my spiritual life. You know, maybe I could do some of the hard work that's not so glamorous, but things that are valuable to me that will bless my life. And I just tell you, doers are willing to tackle hard things. And Christianity is not just about ease and comfort. And God's going to ask you to do some hard things and take some narrow roads and go uphill and sometimes go upstream and sometimes be different than the world. And uh, he does that. I mean, he just tells you right up front. That's what he wants. Discipline. Learn to share your faith with others, using your gifts and talents for God's glory. So, okay, you ready for number three? Number one, doers can learn from others. Learn from people, the good, the bad, and the ugly, from your family, from your friends. Get in the company of some heroes. Number two, doers tackle hard things. Christianity is not about ease and comfort, but it's about doing hard things. And then number three, doers overcome adverse circumstances. They overcome adverse circumstances. So lots of people would do something if it was great. Like, I know lots of times Vic and I will say, like, all right, we should walk. But then it's too hot or it's too cold. I mean, it's almost always one or the other. Too hot or too cold or too wet or too sunny. So it takes, I, I mean, there's just not very many days with perfect circumstances for walking. You know, I mean, if I'm... So if I can always find a reason not to do that. I can always find a reason. So let's note some of the circumstances of our friend Benaiah. So I said he killed two, Mo, uh, two Moabites, but notice what it says um, in verse 22. It says, Benaiah killed two sons of Ariel of Moab. So Ariel 
like that's a that it's kind of a play on words because the Hebrew word for lion is very similar to that word Ariel, and it's sort of saying he killed these two guys that were like they were like lions. They were uh, lion-hearted or the strength of lions. That's kind of the pun there. It's hard to get just in English, but it's a, it's a little play on words. And these so there's two of them, by the way. First of all. I mean, I don't know. I've never done like Mortal Kombat. I mean, I know there's a game, but I'm just saying real Mortal Kombat I've never done. But if I ever have to do it, I only want like one will be plenty. One other guy. Two does not seem like that's a fair circumstance. But for whatever reason, there were two Moabites and he had to fight two of them at once. And they were like lion hearted guys. This is a hard thing. Circumstances were not that good. Notice about the lion. I talked about him killing the lion. The Bible... <laughs> I love this detail. He says, and he went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. He didn't just kill a lion, but he went into a pit, which is an inconvenient place. You know, that's not like if I'm going to, I don't know that I picture myself fighting a lion, but if I do, I don't, I'm not going down into a pit with a lion. That just seems really, like it seems like a bad idea. If I could be frank, a bad idea. Who does that? To go into a pit. You, he could have said legitimately, I'm sorry, guys. I know the lion needs to get killed. I don't know. Maybe it's a man eater or something they had to kill. I don't know. Whatever reason. I, but I can't do that. I mean, normally you could count on me to kill the lion, but not, I mean, it's in a pit. You see that clearly. And I'm not going down to the pit with that thing. And it's on a snowy day. I mean, like you can, do you remember snow? It's hard to think about snow here in the summertime, but remember snow, I mean, it's, it's like slippery, you know? Do you remember that? Slippery, really slippery. He could have slipped. I mean, who goes down in the pit to fight a lion on a snowy day? And the circumstances are terrible. He could have said, like, a thousand people before him and a thousand people, well, millions of people after him. Yeah, no, I, listen, I would accept it's too hot, or it's too cold, it's too sunny, it's too rainy. It's down in the pit, and it's snowing. And there's always a reason. I mean, really, there's always a reason why you can't do what God wants you to do. I'll just tell you, if you, do, if you run out of like, uh, reasons why you can't do what God wants you to do, the enemy will supply you with a never-ending list of reasons why you can't do what God wants you to do. An inconvenient place, or an inconvenient time, Hey, wait till the snow's melted, you know? Maybe, like, maybe lure the lion onto some better terrain or something. I don't know. And then the Egyptian. And I love the story about the Egyptian. Verse 23, he killed an Egyptian who was seven and a half feet tall. That's a tall guy. Seven and a half feet tall. I mean, it's a, it's like a, it's a big, big guy. I mean, like, if you watch NBA, there's only a few guys that ever... Most of them, I mean, there are a lot of seven-footers, but this guy's tall even for a tall guy. And then it says, even though the Egyptian had a spear in his hand like a weaver's beam. So a weaver's beam is the, I mean, I don't really know what a weaver's beam is. It's a big thing, right? It's a great biggie. It's like a big spear. I don't weave a lot, but if I did, I would get a big weaver's beam. I know, I know that. And it's so big that it's like really impressive that this guy with giant hands is, has that spear. And poor Benaiah, the Bible says, went down to him with a club. I don't, like the whole detail of this is so amazing. This is, sometimes you see the Bible just say, that is, if someone's making it up, they wouldn't make this up, right? They wouldn't say, he went down with a club. You know, who go, but for whatever reason, Benaiah, I don't know if he didn't have a spear handy, there's no swords around, but he just takes a club and, he's, and the Bible says he snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. You talk about inconvenience, you talk about the disadvantage. I bet some of you are, like you said, I can't, I, the disadvantages I have in my life mean I can't really do, you know, I can't do anything for God because whatever it is, whatever it is, I got this disadvantage. My dad wasn't in my life. My, I don't know, my, I, we didn't have much money, you know, in my family or my mom was whatever crazy or no, not your mom. I mean, it's probably someone sitting by. It's probably not your mom. It's the people sitting around. Or, you know, whatever it was, whatever, it was, a thousand reasons, right? You have disadvantages. 
There's a sense in which all of us have some disadvantages. And Benaiah is going to go down. There's a guy, as an Egyptian, who for whatever reason has to be killed. And Benaiah, with a club, goes down to this Egyptian with a seven and a half foot giant wingspan, long spear, like a weaver's beam, however big that must have been. And he just, and he does it. So if you're waiting for perfect circumstances, great. You just might as well get used to waiting. If you said, man, I've heard this a lot of times, someday, someday I'm going to, and what we mean by it is we say when circumstances are better, you know, when it's not snowing and it's not a pit and the guy's not seven and a half feet tall, and then, boy, you can count on me then. I'm going to trust Christ as my Savior someday. You can't. You either trust Christ in the present tense or not at all. There's no such thing as trusting Christ in the future. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. I don't know. I don't even know that none of us even have a promise about the future. All we have is today. So if you're waiting for circumstances, someday I'm going to, you know, I'm really going to, I'm going to get active then. I'm going to get connected. I'm going to study the Bible. I'm going to learn. I mean, I know I don't, I know I've been saying that for a while, but I'm going to, when circumstances are better, no, probably not. Benaiah didn't wait for circumstances to change. He did hard things at hard times, in hard places, because they needed to be done. And I, I'm just crazy enough to ask you to do that. Just, I mean, I'm not saying you have to go, like, don't look for any Egyptians to kill. I'm not saying uh, no lions around here, really. Maybe a, you know, a few coyotes or something, but that's not as impressive. But I want to ask you to do hard things. Because God asks you to do hard things and to climb some mountains for the Lord and to do things that other people don't understand. I'm just telling you, if you decide to follow Jesus, there's not, not, not everybody, maybe you're, you're going to be surprised by this, not everybody in the culture is going to say, oh, delighted to hear that you're following the Lord. Boy, isn't that so, I mean, you'll suddenly become the most popular person. They'll probably, you know, elect you to some office or something if you follow the Lord. They'll probably make you the president of the of the. Uh, job site or something. I don't know. I mean, right? It's not always that popular to follow the Lord, but it's always right. And Benaiah said, I'm going to do hard things. I'm going to do hard things in inconvenient times with inconvenient places and difficult circumstances because that's what needs to be done. So some of you would say, oh, I love, boy, wouldn't it be great? I'd love to be the commander of the army like uh, Benaiah was with Solomon. He'd never, that never would have happened had he not been willing to do hard things like in a pit when nobody's People aren't watching you in a pit, you know? He'd have, never, he'd have never become that leader in the nation in, in charge of helping all those young soldiers be willing to fight the battles for the nation of Israel had he not been willing to do these little hard things in pits on a snowy day. And so maybe you're in a pit. I don't know. I mean, life's hard. And you're in a pit, and you say, because of that, I can't. And I'm just saying, yeah. You know, here's why. Because the same God who helped David defeat Goliath is the God who helped Benaiah defeat that Egyptian, is the same God who helps you face the battles that you face. The same God. He's not, any, he's not weaker. He's not unable. So, got some bad circumstances? I don't doubt it. You've had some disadvantages. You've come from some, you've, you've, done, you've got some past and some baggage. I don't, I don't doubt that. I'm just saying God uses people like that all the time because God's the one who ultimately gives the power to do what needs to be done. But he's waiting for you to not be just a hearer of the word. Don't be hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. Be doers of the word, not, just, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. But just do it. Sometimes that's just, sometimes it just takes you saying, all right, God, I don't know all the, what the future holds. I just know you hold it. And so, yes, I, I, don't, even know what they, I don't even know what you want. But yes, I mean, if you want it, yes. And if that means something that's fairly easy, great. Something that seems smooth and comfortable, fine. But if that means something hard and difficult, fine. Because that just, those are just circumstances. I'm just, I just want to say yes to you and be willing to do hard things. 
And I'm telling you, if you, man, if you, if you do that, if you'd say, God, I'll do hard things. Man, God, do what's right because it's right. Not because it's easy, not because it's popular, not because it makes you feel better, but because it's right. And God will honor and bless that. So I want to ask you to bow with me for a moment. And I'm just going to suggest a couple of things that maybe God would want to do in your life. Maybe there's some of you here who you need to be saved. Maybe you just need to trust Christ as Savior. And you've said maybe, you know, yeah, I should trust Christ as my Savior. And someday I will. I want, why not tonight? The Bible says we need to repent of our sins, place our faith in Jesus who died for us and rose from the grave. And receive him as Savior. Ask him to save you, and he will. You could be saved tonight. Yes. Christian, maybe God brought you here because there's some hard things you know God wants you to do. He wants you to obey him, maybe in your job or your school or in your family, or maybe to be a witness with some friends or some coworkers or some classmates, and those are hard things. But you've, to this point, you've kind of said, well, it's not a convenient time. And then God just hits you with that Benaiah story. Come on. Let's, let's, let's go down in a pit on a snowy day and do hard things that God wants us to do. To be a witness in a world that, in, in a world that we, don't even, we don't even always know how they'll respond. To be faithful would it be a lot easier not to be unfaithful. To do what's right, and sometimes it's a lot easier to do wrong. To go uphill when downhill is so much smoother. But God is calling you to do hard things. Will you say yes to him? Father, thank you for your word and the truth you teach us. And I thank you for the way you've used this story of Benai in my life. Just to remind me, I, I, I know how easy it is for me just to take the easy road instead of the, instead of the right road. How much there's a part of my flesh that just wants to do what's easy what's popular, what's comfortable. And yet sometimes you say, man, you got following me can be hard. And you tell us in your word, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so, Lord, I want to follow you. And so help me to deny myself and help me to take up my cross daily and help me to follow you. And there are, there are many in this room who want to follow you. And so I pray, Lord, you'll help them to deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow you. And I pray they'll be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving themselves. And I pray they'll learn the lessons that Benaiah is there to teach us so that we're willing to do the hard things that you want us to do. And I pray this in Jesus' name.